Today we're going to focus on the question, why the United Church of Christ? And it may seem somewhat odd to be asking the question about the existence of an institution that's been around for quite some time, is quite well known, and is historically identified as one of the significant players in the social justice movement, not just of the 20th century, but its roots go even deeper than that. And you may also be thinking why the United Church of Christ is an historical exploration of the question of our origins. And I will confess that part of what we will be talking about here will be the historic origins of this beloved denomination. But that's not the point of our gathering here and asking the question, why the United Church of Christ? Whether we're talking about the United Church of Christ or any other part of the body of Christ attached to the institutions that we now recognize as a part of the church, including your own local congregations, I think it is an important exercise and discipline to step back and ask the question, why us? If we were to disappear tomorrow, who would suffer for it? Who would miss us? And what essential mission or ministry would be left undone by our absence. And the truth of the matter is, if you can't successfully answer that question, you have lost your reason for being. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was important, especially in this time when institutions are experiencing collectively a diminished capacity for relevance, a diminished capacity for missional impact, a diminished capacity for attracting more and more members to us, I thought it was important for us to ask the question, do we still have, in God's eyes, a missional imperative that compels us to fight tooth and bone to maintain our existence for the sake of that mission? That's the question we're exploring. I want to begin with a statement a quote from Michael Kinnaman, who recently resigned as the General Secretary of the National Council of Churches. Uh, Michael is a dear friend of mine, um, and I've known him for quite some time. <coughs> One asked, as a General Secretary of the National Council of Churches, what was the purpose of denominations? And understand that question was asked in a context of this dawning age of post-modernity when people are wondering whether or not denominations are still necessary in order for the gospel to be preserved, Michael Kinnaman's response was, denominations exist to perpetuate an aspect of the gospel that but for them would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. Now understand, we're exploring here today the question, why the United Church of Christ? If we are, by the end of our time together, going to answer affirmatively that the United Church of Christ is necessary, then we must be able to identify an aspect of the gospel that but for us would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. Or we have lost our reason to exist. So we're going to take a journey backwards and forwards in the exploration of this question, why the United Church of Christ? I'll give away the ending. Um, I am a passionate advocate for the ongoing missional presence that belongs to the United Church of Christ. It's why I do this presentation. Because I do believe there is a legitimate reason for our existence. And I do believe that there is, in fact, an aspect of the gospel in danger of diminishment or extinction, but for our faithful proclamation of that gospel. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, I'll warn you, Ed, I'm going to try and juggle five different puzzle pieces that I hope come together in one unified form by the end of this as I draw my conclusion, um, having given away the end, the conclusion that there is a purpose for the United Church of Christ. Um, we're going to look at biblical reasons. We're going to look at historical reasons. We're going to look at existential reasons. Forgive me, I'm an old philosopher by trade. Um, and we're going to do some existential work. Um, we're going to look at political reasons and we're going to look at missional reasons for the United Church of Christ and answering the question, why the United Church of Christ? And begin with biblical reasons. And although there are a number of passages that I think are central to 
the core values of the United Church of Christ, I'm going to focus on two. One of which, if you have any knowledge of the United Church of Christ's birth origins, you'll know immediately it's on our logo. Every time we look at the UCC logo and it hangs prominently in the sanctuary of this church, you'll read John chapter 17, verse 21, that they may all be one. The second is much more obscure. It's the 82nd Psalm. And I'd like to claim that I'm a brilliant enough biblical scholar to be the one responsible for some of the exegetical work I'm going to do on that in a minute or two. But the truth is John Dominic Crossan is the one who turned me on to this pretty obscure passage in the middle of the book of Psalms. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Just a quick word, though, about that passage from John 21. And... Where that prayer, and that's what it was, this was a prayer uttered by Jesus on the night that he would gather his disciples for one last meal and turn himself over to be persecuted and crucified. <clears throat> Why that prayer not only remains for us today a part of our missional imperative, we need to discover why, when we formed in 1957, of all of the verses in Scripture, this one was singled out as the one that would serve as our missional directive, that they may all be one. It's an interesting question to pose, if I were a dying Savior, and I'm not, but what would I, on my last night on this earth, knowing it was my last night on this earth, and knowing that I was gathered with the men and women that I would send forth to keep the mission alive, what would I be praying for? Um, and here's why I would make a very good Savior. I'd be praying for obedience, probably first and foremost. I'd be praying for good Sunday attendance. I'd be praying that they would put money in the offering plate to support the mission, good stewardship, all of those things. Jesus prayed for our unity, that they may all be one. As he was leaving, the only thing he asked of his disciples is that they be one. Um, he, the, the line that precedes that is telling. He doesn't pray that for those gathered here this evening, in other words, the disciples, but for all who would come to believe in Jesus because of their proclamation. So we're not stretching things at all to suggest that we were among the ones that night that Jesus was praying for, and therefore his prayer wasn't just that they be one, but that we be one. And upon reflection, it occurs to me that if their message was simply the good news of God's redeeming and transformative love and the power of that love to change the world, then that message would be ill-received if proclaimed by a group of people who couldn't demonstrate their love for one another. And our evangelical passion will always be compromised by our inability to bring the body together as one. And so that was his prayer. Now we're going to get to the Reformation in a minute when we start talking about the historical reasons why the United Church of Christ, and we'll hit this again. But one of the reasons the United Church of Christ came into being was the body recognized that our division was compromising our capacity to proclaim the gospel. And we had better learn to be one if the world was going to accept our proclamation about the transformative nature of God's love with any credibility. So, one of the biblical imperatives for birthing the United Church of Christ is that passage from John's Gospel. The more obscure one, and I read this often when I do this present, I rarely have anybody say, oh, I know that Psalm, the 82nd Psalm. Um, I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to talk about its content and why John Dominic Crossan argued in his landmark book, The Birth of Christianity, that this may be the most significant piece of scripture in the canon. And what it has to do with the missional imperative of the United Church of Christ. So it begins this way. God has taken God's place in the divine council. And in the midst of all of the gods, our God holds judgment. Quotation marks. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan, maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked, unquote. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. 
I say, quote, you are God's children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Close quote. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. Now, I read this, as I've just done, and then I tend to test the why. What did you hear in here that suggests to you that this is the most significant piece of scripture in all of the canon? And the answer is, it, when you hear it, it doesn't seem all that significant or important. So let me try and um, open that up a bit, as John Dominic Crossan does. Again, this is not my original thought. This is all this brilliant Irish biblical scholar, archaeologist, anthropologist, who's one of the most incredible minds I've ever come across. This reads like an episode of Law and Order. You, you may not realize that, but this is an unfolding courtroom drama. The opening scene is God assembled in front of all of the gods, an interesting piece in our canon, yes, as monotheists, an admission here in our own scripture that God resides with all of the other gods. But this psalm and the author of this psalm are going to make a claim about this God that separates ours from all others. But the scene opens up, and it's a courtroom drama, and there is a judge... There is a prosecutor, there is a jury, there is a verdict, there is a sentence. All of that is in here. The remarkable thing is that every single role, the judge, the prosecutor, the jury, the sentencing, is all done by the same person. So even we have, though we have a, an entire council assembled here, the only actor is the one whom we know is our God and Creator. And so this psalmist is opening up a narrative and making here a claim about there may be other gods, but there's only one with authority to speak. And the question then becomes, what is it that separates this God from all of the others and then gives this God that authority? So, God sits as judge and as judge reads the charge against the accused. And although their divine counsel is assembled, they don't realize until after this sentence is read that they are in fact the accused, that they're the ones on trial. How long will you, addressing the other gods, judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? That statement there gives us a glimpse into the character and nature of what separates this God from all others. Power is to be used if only, if only it refuses to show partiality to the wicked. Those of you who just spent the last weekend in Albuquerque studying liberation theology have heard the phrase God's preferential option for the poor. If, as a God, your preferential option is for the powerful and the mighty and the wicked, then you are no God. And that will ultimately be the verdict of this judge in the divine council. God goes on to speak, as God is the only one with voice in this courtroom drama, saying, give justice to the weak, the orphan, maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. No one heard the cries of the slave. Here we are later in our relationship, our unfolding relationship with this God who was holding counsel before the, the gods and identifying them, charging them as criminals because they have not paid attention to the cries of the lowly and the destitute and the poor and the weak and the orphan and the widow and the needy. And that's what separated this God from all others. So the sentence is read. The quotations close, the voice of the judge goes silent for a second, and the narrator continues saying, they have, this is the narrator giving commentary, you can imagine that in uh, this sort of CNN sort of environment, here's the news reporter with the microphone, they have neither knowledge nor understanding, that's what the judge is saying here, and they walk around in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. God goes on. You are God's children of the Most High, all of you. And here comes the, the verdict and the sentence. Nevertheless, you shall die like, mortals and fall, die like mortals and fall like any prince. The judge has spoken, pronounced the verdict, and given the sentence. And in fact, it's a death sentence. 
that you did not care for the weak and the needy and the orphan and the widow means that you shall give up your power. It is no longer needed. It is no longer of any value. And you will die like any mortal. And then the quotations close. The narrator intervenes once more. And here we get the, the voice of worship. Rise up, O God, and judge the earth. Only you. Only you who hear the cries of the poor, who see the weak, the orphan, the needy, the widow, only you, the destitute, only you, rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. So these are our biblical imperatives. Now when I did this exercise over 15 hours with uh, Southwest Conference delegates gathered for the Lay Academy, the first thing we did is say, Tell me, scattershot, brainstorming, what you do when you go to church. And we put up about four pages of newsprint. Um, we, we worship, we do Sunday school, we have youth activities, we have committee meetings, we have deacon boards, we have stewardship campaigns, we have potluck dinners, and you can see how this list would go on for quite a while. If we're asking the question, why the United Church of Christ, then we have to look at that list and say, of all of the things up there, if the United Church of Christ were to disappear next week, what would be eliminated? <clears throat> would there still be sermons? Yes, there would. Would there still be potluck dinners? Yes, there would. Would there still be committee meetings? Yes, there would. Well, what's up there right now that you experience at church that if the United Church of Christ disappeared, would be absent tomorrow? Now we're getting to the core of that question that Michael Kinneman asked. A denomination exists to perpetuate an aspect of the gospel that but for them would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. So we weren't birthed to preach. We weren't birthed to lead worship. We weren't birthed to do potlucks. We weren't birthed to do committee meetings. And within seconds, two things on that list of four appeared immediately. An extravagant welcome and a commitment, an unconditional commitment to justice. If God separates all others who claim power based on their commitment to the poor, the destitute, the weak, the widow, the orphan, the needy, then the United Church of Christ stands out for its clear commitments to the marginalized and those with no voice and no power. This is who we are. This is who we were birthed to be. And in 1957, when we gathered, we reminded ourselves that we have a clear missional imperative to unify the body and to maintain what had already been by that point our historic commitment to justice. These are the biblical reasons why the United Church of Christ. There are some historical reasons too and to, to get at the roots of those we're going to go all the way back to the time of the Reformation because prior to the Reformation there were no and I shouldn't say there were no options. There were options, but the options were basically limited to what part of the globe you would have it in. And for most of our ancestors, Roman Catholicism was the pathway through Christianity. We can actually trace the roots of why the UCC back in time to Constantine. Um, Constantine changed the nature of what it means to be the church as we went from a small minority sect within an empire persecuted by empire to walking around on the globe with the imprimatur of the emperor and now carrying the sword with us and through the times of the crusades and the pogroms um, and the inquisition actually with that sword forcing people to convert or die. That's a very different way of being church. That's tracing these historical roots back, not to the time of the Reformation, but to the time of Constantine. And so we can claim that. But I'm going to go forward to the time of the Reformation and our exploration of the historical roots of why the United Church of Christ. And there are two things in particular I want to focus on. The first is that although Martin Luther never imagined that denominationalism or Protestantism or Lutheranism would be the result of his tacking those 95 theses to the doors of the cathedral at Wittenberg, nonetheless, that's exactly what would happen. All he wanted was to have the church step back and remind itself what it meant to be the church. And although he wasn't using the 82nd Psalm as the background noise for his 95 Theses, he could well have. 
Because in essence what he was saying is that you have become the power structure that we were built to preach against. And you are yourself more adorned with and impressed by your wealth and power and might and have created practices within the faith that benefit those with more money. And we don't need to get into too much detail about what indulgences were, but you were in effect paying for the remission of your sins and the sins of those loved ones who died before you. And obviously then, the more money you had, the more likely you would be to pay for the remission of somebody else's sins. Uh, Luther attacked the foundations of that way of being church, and far from intending to birth an entire new way of being church, and actually intending to remind us, to take us all the way back to our roots, um, nonetheless what happened is, you know, the power of the Roman Catholic Church didn't just say to Luther, oh, you're right, let's give back all our money, let's give back all our land, let's give back all our wealth, and let's let go of all of our power. And they didn't do that, and so the only, the only option left was to sort of break away from and try to birth something new. Well, Luther became Zwingli, became Calvin, became any number of reformers, and we wake up 200 years later, and we're not just the Christian church, and we're not just the Roman Catholic church, but we're the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, the Episcopal church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Disciples church, the United Church of Christ, the Quaker church, the Mennonite church, and now we number into the tens of thousands of denominational, independent denominational identities. So there are two things to note about these historic reference in relation to why the United Church of Christ the first is this notion of always reforming. God is still speaking. There is yet and still more light and truth to break forth from these holy words. We must onward still and upwards who would keep abreast of truth. This is our genetic material. And we are a people in the United Church of Christ who question everything. I went from eight years in the Roman Catholic Seminary, decided to leave, because I wasn't sure I believed all of the teachings of the church and my vow of obedience upon ordination would require me to require my congregants to believe what I had not yet come to believe. <laughs> and I sat in the classroom literally for eight years asking the questions, why do we believe this? Why does the church teach this? And the response was always, almost without exception, John, this has been the teaching of the church for 2,000 years. Who are you to question it? I ended up working with a painting contractor. I told somebody earlier today, I graduated with a degree in Aristotelian to mystic philosophy and looked around and asked who was hiring. And I got a job with a painting contractor. <laughs> Walked into the dean's office. David Greenhouse is now the president of Eden Theological Seminary. He was the dean of students at the time. Walked into his office at the end of the workday, smelly, paint all over me and said, I want to go to seminary. And he looked at me like, are you crazy? But in that initial conversation, he told me about the United Church of Christ. We question everything. And I knew, I knew in that moment I had come home. I knew that I had discovered a part of the body of Christ that would let my ministry flourish. And those roots go all the way back to the days of Martin Luther. But the byproduct of the Reformation is this division of the body that was tearing us apart at the seams and continues to. And in the midst of that, Leaders from four disparate denominations who really had no business being together found a way to take everything that logically should have and had separated them and said, we need to understand that our love for each other and our passion for the gospel trumps everything. And what brings us to the table is far more valuable and important than what keeps us from coming together. And they formed this United Church of Christ Claiming is our motto, that prayer of Jesus, that they may all be one. So whereas in the, 15, the 1600s, uh, 1500, 16th century, Martin Luther felt the need to tack those theses to the, the door of the church and realized that for the sake of the gospel it was time to split, in 1957 the founders of this denomination realized it was time to come together that the value of our proclamation would always be compromised by the divisiveness that had come to characterize us. 
So those are some of the historical reasons for why the United Church of Christ. There are existential reasons, existential, ontological, we can even say theological reasons. And here we get at the core, the heart of who God is. And I think my theology is built on two existential, ontological claims about God, one of which we've already discovered in the 82nd Psalm, God is just. And we could go through an entire litany of biblical passages that make that argument. But there's a second ontological existential claim made about God in the letter, John's first letter. And that is the simple, bold statement, God is, fill in the blank for me, love. love. That's right. God is love. That's an existential statement. Nowhere do we feel the presence and power of God more palpably than when we experience the transformative power of love. It changes the world. It is the energy, it is the passion, it is the fuel that feeds the gospel and our place in it. And so when we begin to ask the question, if we were to create or recreate the church in the image of God who is love, what would it look like? And while I certainly don't want to claim that the United Church of Christ holds a monopoly on creating itself in the image of a God who is love, we get this right. That doesn't mean, and trust me, I've sat with enough of your councils who have been in conflict with your <laughs> pastors, that doesn't mean that in every single moment in the United Church of Christ, we practice this recreation of a church built in the image of a God who is love. But everything about us from the ground up was built to express the proclamation of God's love. And while we don't have a monopoly, when we talk about the proclamation of an extravagant welcome that in its core believes and teaches that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, and the fact of the matter is, we get this right. Whether we practice it all the time or not doesn't matter. Claiming that as our missional imperative, the proclamation of a gospel of an extravagant welcome offered by a God who offers extravagant love is the calling card that pushes all of us behind our, beyond our comfortable boundaries and teaches us to see the other with new eyes. There's that beautiful passage in the 10th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, where the opening line of Peter's sermon to the Gentiles is, truly I perceive that God shows no partiality. Begging the question, what does it mean to recreate the church in the image of a God who shows no partiality? And essentially saying to us, the question before us is not can we accept the other, whoever the other may be, it's can we accept a God who already has? The United Church of Christ has taken up that practice as an essential ingredient to our way of being. So there are ontological, existential, deep theological reasons for the birthing of and recreating of the church in the fashion of the United Church of Christ. There are political reasons, and here I'm not talking about the sort of inner political machinations that every church and every conference and every denomination is familiar with and bemoans the practice of, but I'm talking in particular about our polity. This is a political conversation about our polity. The polity is just an old Greek word that means it's how you govern yourself. How do you empower people who are part of the body to make decisions? If we were an Episcopal polity, as some of our ecumenical partners are, we would entrust the power makers to be the decision makers, namely the bishops. And again, I grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition and was eight years on a pathway to be ordained as a Roman Catholic uh, priest and would have taken a vow of obedience, would, which would have meant that my mouth belonged to the bishop. I could not speak beyond the limits that the bishop had authorized me to speak. Um, 
And there are other decisions in an Episcopal polity that belong to the bishop. If a church opens or closes, that's a decision made by the bishop. If a man or a woman presents themselves for ordination in an Episcopal polity, the bishop makes the decision. We have a very different way of empowering decision-making in the life of the United Church of Christ. I used to travel the country on a speaking tour after my first book came out with a Methodist clinical psychologist slash minister by the name of, of Andrew Weaver. And he was a good old Southern Texan. Spoke with a thick, heavy Texas drawl. And he used to, I would introduce him and he would introduce me, and he would say, John's with the United Church of Christ, the last truly democratic body in the United States of America. <laughs> if we are to be the priesthood of all believers, if we are to extend an extravagant welcome, if we are to be a body that proclaims the unity of the body of Christ, then we have to structure ourselves in such a way that all voices are heard. And not just heard in some sort of patronizing, condescending, well, that was nice, now I'm going to go do what I'm going to do kind of way, but in a way that matters. At every level of the United Church of Christ, the voice of the local church member is heard and matters and is relevant. So let's talk about ordination. When I do my polity class, I tell them, I'm not the bishop. The Committee on Ministry, those 12 men and women elected by our delegates at an annual meeting and representatives of your individual church who are at the annual meeting because they have either been elected or appointed by your membership, not your pastor, gather and elect 12 men and women from around the conference who sit at a table and examine every candidate that comes before them and test the question, is this person fit for ministry in and on behalf of the United Church of Christ? That's democracy. That's creating the church in such a way that every voice is empowered. We were birthed out of those old congregational churches up in the Northeast who created the town hall meeting and who made it possible for every citizen to come together with voice and vote. And so when we write our bylaws and our constitutions, we guarantee that membership matters and brings with it the power, the authority, and the responsibility to determine not just the business workings of your church, but your theology in your practice, so that when a resolution passes at General Synod, in a hierarchical polity, we would say that General Synod carries more weight than the voice of a local church, and every time we have a General Synod, every newspaper in the question, in the paper, every newspaper in the country gets it wrong. They will report in the headlines, the United Church of Christ affirms gay marriage. And then in the article, they'll talk about the impact that that has on our clergy and our churches. And they get it wrong. The mistake they make is they assume that General Synod, General Synod speaks for our churches. They don't. They speak to our churches. And our churches then get to gather independently, one by one, with all of the voting members present to determine whether or not they believe that to be true. And in a very biblical way, we bind ourselves in our polity, not by contract, not by law, not by bylaw, by not by constitution, but by covenant. That's how God relates to us, in covenant. And the beauty of covenant is someone might break the strictures of the contract, and then by law you get to sever the relationship. With covenant, when one partner breaks the rubrics, you got to stay in the relationship. This is who we are. And if we are to live out all of those biblical and ontological reasons for being, there was no other polity that we could create to allow us to be who we are. So at every level, even the polity of the United Church of Christ has a clear missional imperative. So we finally get to the last reason, the last answer to the question why, and that is missional imperative. It should be pretty clear to us by now 
that the United Church of Christ was birthed to be a church of extravagant welcome, committed to social justice, and about the task of, in love, unifying the body. We are in the age, whether we like this or not, of post-modernity. And we're early enough in that that we're only taking our best guesses of what that might look like. But there's not a church left anywhere in America, if not in the globe, that isn't feeling the impact of all the ground shifting underneath us in this time of the postmodern world. That's a whole other presentation. The difference between the age of enlightenment and the age of postmodernity and what that means for our churches. We don't need to get into that. The fact of the matter is, what you grew up experiencing in church that made the faith come alive for you ain't working for your children and grandchildren. And some among us have drawn the conclusion that the church is dead, that the gospel is no longer relevant, that the faith itself will disappear within two or three generations. We've heard all of these dire predictions. And that's just wrong. I spent my entire sabbatical last summer traveling the country and interviewing and spending time with postmodern faith leaders. And I'm here to tell you the faith is alive and well. The gospel is alive and well. And maybe every denomination and every part of the institution because of that is saying to themselves, our time for being has come and gone. As long as there are people like those gathered here today who continue to have their faith fed by the institutional model of the church, then we have a missional imperative to keep on. But once post-modernity takes over, it's time for us to disappear. And there could be a legitimate argument made for that. Our question here today is not why the institution or why the church or why denominations. It is specifically why the United Church of Christ. And the last thing I want to say in response to that question why is there remains a clear missional imperative into the age of post-modernity for the United Church of Christ to remain strong and healthy and vital. Because, and we're going all the way back to where we started here with Michael Kinnaman, denominations exist to perpetuate, not for a time, to perpetuate for all time an aspect of the gospel that but for them is in danger of diminishment or extinction. And as the postmodern world and the postmodern faith begins to take shape, if the voice and presence of the United Church of Christ is absent, then where is the missional imperative to be one? Where is the missional imperative to claim as a core value the proclamation of and the commitment to social justice? The attention to the marginalized, the destitute, the weak, the needy, and the poor. Where is the clear call to an extravagant welcome that says no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here? And where is the call to shape yourself with a polity that honors every voice? If we disappear from the marketplace, then postmodern Christianity, postmodern faith will go on, but I trust you, it will look remarkably different than if we maintain our presence, our voice, our health, and our vitality. And that's my answer to the question, why the United Church of Christ? Given everything about our understandings of Scripture, given everything about the historic origins that conspired to birth this movement in 1957, given everything we know about the commitments we made to shape a polity that honors every voice, we have and will into the foreseeable future maintain a clear missional imperative given to us by the Holy Spirit to continue to preach this gospel from the voice of a still speaking God whose most powerful message remains, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here.